I kind of want to go to the end before the beginning here. What I love about Abraham is that, you know, the Bible doesn't whitewash it, does it? He's the father of our faith. But wow, you can really, if you really uh, read through that chapter a couple times and focus on it, you can really see the fight of faith, the struggle of faith that Abraham's having there uh, in this chapter. And we'll point out a couple of those things as we go along. But what I love about Abraham is that uh, you can describe really his life with one word. Faith, of course, the Bible says that. But besides faith, can you think of one word that would describe Abraham? Obedience. The other ones work, but obedience is the word. Abraham obeyed God, didn't he? Wow, look at the obedience of Abraham. Through it all, like I said, the Bible doesn't whitewash it, man. They struggled, didn't they? I mean, they, they struggled. There was a fight of faith. And the Bible says, fight the good fight of faith in a... a 2 Timothy 6.12, maybe? Is that it? Fight the good fight of faith? And I've always said that the only good fight is the fight that you win. Sometimes you don't look like you're winning when you're in the middle of the fight. That's what's cool about God's government and God's way of doing things. God's pretty, uh, pretty shrewd, uh, very shrewd. And a lot of times it's when you look like you've lost that God turns the tide around and you win. Amen? Abraham won the fight of faith. And uh, he became the father of faith for us all. And the word that encapsulates the life of Abraham is obey or obedience. Because you just see how rapidly Abraham did that here. I mean, God just, uh, now I don't know about other ancient cultures and customs. And, you know, this could be something that other places did from time to time. But God told Abraham, he said, you know, I want you to circumcise yourself, Ishmael, your servants, your household. That's a pretty big deal, really, if you think about it. These are adult people, most of them. And Abraham, you know, he just, he just didn't blink or miss a beat. He obeyed God, and he obeyed God. And that's, that's what really sets Abraham apart. Not that he didn't waver. The Bible does say he didn't waver in his faith. Um, but he, he kind of did waver, in a sense, because he messed up, if you mean messing up. If you, the Bible doesn't say he didn't mess up, because Abraham did mess up. We've seen that. But he didn't waver in the sense that he, he always obeyed God. Once he heard God, he obeyed God, and he believed God, and that's why it was credited to him uh, as righteousness. Sometimes uh, an interesting thing I, I've witnessed about faith, both in my life and the life of other people, is that you find it in strange places. There are people that they don't look like they believe God, and yet down at the core level of who they are, they believe God. They just believe Him. And then there are people that talk the talk all the time about believing God, and yet they really don't believe God at all. And uh, God looks at the heart, not at the outward appearance, right? So, you know, I, uh, I'm not against faith teachers, and I'm not even against good, the good prosperity gospel, God-honoring wealth. God will prosper us. But I wonder if you went to Kenneth Copeland's church, how many people are walking according to the faith that they're hearing in every message? I bet a high percentage of them aren't, right? But that's, uh, we all have a choice. We all have a choice to make. And uh, sometimes you find faith, faith in, in, in just strange places, places where you don't uh, e expect to see it. You know, I think that uh, some of you will know who I'm talking about, but there's a family from the well that, i got to be honest with you, I thought maybe they would be the first ones out the door, and they stuck through all the transitions, all the moves, all the times, and, you know, they're still there very faithfully through it all. You find faith in strange places sometimes, don't you? And I'm telling you, there's not, there's not a uh, church survey on this earth or in this country that you would have took that would have said that they would have been one of the staple people that would have stuck there through it all. But see, God doesn't look at our education level or our outward appearance or at even if we get knocked around a little bit, God doesn't look at anything. God looks at our faith. God looks at our heart. And uh, sometimes faith isn't very diagnosable to the naked eye, but God knows where it's at. And God always honors faith. When he sees faith, he honors it. Amen? So uh, we see Abraham obeying God here in this chapter. Um, okay, so Abraham here had a renewal of faith. 
God had to help Abraham look beyond Ishmael in this chapter. Because, you know, the, uh, now Ishmael's 13 here, and Abraham was still believing God, but you know how sometimes you believe God, but you kind of put it on the back burner? You really do believe it's going to happen someday, but you get so accustomed to working it out. <laughs> you, you're so used to finding a way to make it work. Okay? I'm like that. I'm good at making things work, man. If I can't, if I can't make it work, it probably can't work. I'm very... It's an anointing from the Holy One that, to make things, things work. But th there's a make it work anointing, but then there's also the fulfillment of things. When God promises something, God's going to bring it to pass. God's going to do what He said He would do. Amen? And God established with Abraham unconditional promises. Now, there's a degree, I, I always got to put some caveats in here. There's a degree in which it was conditional, and maybe part of the reason it took so long was, you know, Abraham's heart and Sarai's heart. Maybe it was, we don't know. But God, when He established His covenant with Abraham, He said, Abraham, you're the man. You're going to have a son. Ishmael's going to, or an Ishmael. Sarah is going to bear you a son, Isaac. Okay? It's coming through you. It's coming through, it's coming through your wife, Sarah. You know, all this other stuff is good, but it was an unconditional promise that God made with him. And you can take that to the bank. When God says something, I'll take a word from God that I know is from God before I'll take a million dollars in the bank. And I mean it. Because when God speaks, you can take it to the bank. It's going gonna, it's gonna to come to pass. And there's that element in which, you know, the, the timing of it all may have a lot to do with our own maturity. It may have a lot to do with our own decisions and, you know, getting on and off the course at times. You know, dear Lord, help us to uh, obey quickly. But when God makes an unconditional promise, it's coming to pass. It's going to be how God said it would be. And uh, that's why his word is so powerful. So we see Abraham's renewal of faith here. God is getting Abraham beyond Ishmael because Abraham was learning how to make Ishmael work. They were working. Remember last chapter, after Ishmael was born, there was all of the conflict and uh, Sarah sent Hagar away and God found Hagar and revealed himself to a pagan and everyone had to humble themselves and submit themselves and come back and God just kind of worked that thing out. He made it, okay, it worked out, but it wasn't God's ultimate plan. Okay, so now God's getting him beyond Ishmael and saying, Abraham, there's still an ultimate plan I have here. Okay, I will bless Ishmael, but I still have the unconditional covenant that I made with you that I'm going to honor regarding Sarai and uh, Isaac. Okay, so some steps. We're not going to deeply talk about all these. We wouldn't have time. But some steps of renewal of faith. First of all, uh, Abraham received a fresh revelation from God in this chapter. And then Abraham made his own new commitment to walk before God and to live a blameless life. Then Abraham had to humble himself before God and listen to God. And then Abraham heard and believed God's covenant once again, his promises. And then he kept the covenant by initiating the ritual of circumcision. Then Abraham changed his approach to family life. If we have time, I'm going to talk about that a little bit tonight. Abraham changed his approach to his family life in this chapter. Abraham accepted the purpose and the will of God. And then Abraham made a public decision to obey God's instructions. I mean, you know, that wasn't something that could be hidden. I mean, he circumcised himself and the whole household, and uh, it's, it's the way that it happened. So there's, those are eight steps of a renewal of faith when you need renewed. He's the father of our faith, so we can follow that model. I'm not going to go through all eight of those tonight. I, if somebody wants a list, I can get, copy that off and give you the list of that. Okay, but the, you can take that uh, to the bank. It'll always work like that. Okay, so God revealed himself to Abraham. Now, we listened to this on the NIV, but in the King uh, James, you'll see that uh, God revealed himself here as El Shaddai. God said he was El Shaddai. Now, that is significant. I believe it's the first time that God revealed himself as El Shaddai. And uh, let me get a couple statistics here for you. Okay, in the Old Testament, God uses the name El Shaddai 48 times, but 31 of those times are in the book of Job alone, leaving only 17 times in the rest of the Old Testament. El Shaddai, 
And as the NIV Bible that we listened to uh, interpreted that, that means Almighty God. How many of you know that when you are 99, going to be 100 before you can have a child, nine months, you're going to be 100, and your wife is 90, how many of you know that you better believe that you got an Almighty God to bring that to pass? <laughs> That's really stretching the limits of faith, isn't it? <laughs> you're all young in this room today. You're all young enough to bear children and start another family. You know, Abraham, that spry guy, I'm going to tell you, you know, Sarah, Sarah, after she had Isaac, and later on she passed, and Abraham remarried, man. <laughs> and he had a bunch more kids. If you're, we'll get to that later on. Man, Abraham was a, you know, had a lot of vitality. He was a spry guy, definitely a blessed man of the of the Lord. But he knew that this wasn't something that could happen in the natural. And he fell on his face, and he kept saying, "God, but Ishmael, but Ishmael, bless Ishmael." Bless Ishmael. And God said, yeah, I'll bless Ishmael, but that's not the covenant that I made with you. The covenant is concerning Sarai, who will become Sarah, and Isaac. Okay, And God revealed himself to Abraham as the Almighty, El Shaddai. Just like in last chapter, when Hagar was fleeing and she was in the desert, God revealed himself to the pagan as the all-seeing God, El Roy. God now reveals himself to Abraham, or Abram, who's becoming Abraham in this chapter. God reveals himself as El Shaddai, the Almighty God. Nothing is too difficult for God. All right? So I'm glad that God finally changes his name because now I'll finally be calling them by the right names, Abraham and Sarah. Okay? I've, I know the difference, but it's just hard when you're speaking to separate it because it's like Elijah and Elisha. <laughs> It's hard when you're preaching to separate it, even though you know the difference. Okay, let's look up just a, a few verses on El Shaddai. Uh, okay, Matthew 19.26. Who would like to look that up? Matthew 19.26, Luke 1.37, and then Revelation 19.6. So we'll take this into the New Testament context. Uh, okay, go for it. Okay, the Lord God omnipotent reigneth, right? I mean, that's, we have those words in our head because it handles uh, Messiah. The Lord God, the omnipotent reigneth. But he's an omnipotent God that's all powerful. Omnipotent, all potent, all powerful, an all powerful uh, God. So, uh, that's the God that we serve, and that's how God revealed himself to Abraham as El Shaddai, the all-powerful God. Um, and, I mean, we know that. I mean, we believe that. That's, you know, Christianity 101. But, again, that's where, you know, you believe something. And I do believe our belief equals our behavior. The way we act is based on what we really believe. But sometimes, why is it if we really believe that God is all-powerful? And we do believe that. We do know that. And we do believe that. Why do we sweat the small stuff? He's all-powerful. All-powerful. El Shaddai. Nothing shall be impossible for God. I mean, a 100-year-old and a 90-year-old can have a baby and have, have uh, the child of promise and nations and kings will come out of them and the people of God will come out of them. All-powerful God. Larry. And amen. It's from our limited perspective. We're, we're thinking his ways are not our ways. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And uh, Mary, while you were talking, what just kind of came to mind, you know, we see that same struggle in Abraham, even though he's the father of our faith. He did believe God was all powerful and he kept uh, addressing God concerning Ishmael. And God kept saying, yeah, I'm going to bless Ishmael, but I'm not talking to you about Ishmael right now. I'm talking about Sarah and Isaac. You know, that, that's the, the covenant that I've made with you is Sarah and Isaac. 
you know, Ishmael, God had to get Abraham beyond Ishmael. He, he was, his eyes were on Ishmael. We're going to make this work. We can work this out. We, God can still fulfill this promise, even though uh, uh, this wasn't the way I thought it was going to be. And God had to move him beyond that. Amen? Amen. Okay, so uh, God reveals himself as the almighty God, El Shaddai. Okay, the next thing we see in the life of Abraham is the spiritual walk of the believer. And I'm not going through all these steps, but... but uh, uh, I just want to catch the whole concept that Abraham walked before God. And it says, it says that here. Um, let me see if I can find it. If somebody finds. Okay, God said that in verse number one. I am almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Walk before me and be, be perfect. Flawless. Now, that's a pretty big commission, isn't it? <laughs> walk before me and be perfect. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. But, but uh, Abraham walked by, before God. It's a walk of faith, isn't it? It's not a leap of faith. Sometimes we talk about it being a leap of faith. It's not. It's not a, it's not a sprint of faith. It's a walk of faith, step by step. I remember someone illustrating that once that they were a little kid and we they had a, a big snowstorm and this drift was high and they had to go out to the barn but their father had gone out before them and so the way they got from the house to the barn was they stepped in their father's footsteps where he had walked and that's what walking walking this out this is why God gives us the example of Abraham uh, we can actually avoid some of the mistakes that Abraham made. I'm glad that God didn't sugarcoat the life of Abraham. We can see what Abraham did, and we can learn from him and not make some of the same mistakes. But even greater, we can learn from the obedience of Abraham and, and the faithfulness of Abraham, and that Abraham did believe God against all odds, and that, that even though he needed encouragement and renewal of faith, that he did in his heart of hearts believe God. Uh, that's walking it out by faith, right? How many of you know that usually when God says, I'm going to do something with you, that that's not tomorrow, <laughs> right? <laughs> because usually it's bigger than us. If it, you know, we've said it many times that if you could do what, if you can do what you feel God wants you to do on your own, then God don't want you to do it. That's not coming from God. He thinks bigger than us. He never tells us to do what we can do on our own then we would get the glory, right? We would say we did it. It would be in our strength. But we're called to, in our weakness, magnify his strength and watch God work miracles. And this is what we see in the walk of Abraham. Okay, so uh, part of the walk of Abraham was holiness. God said, walk blameless before me or walk holy before me. The word is tamin or tamin in the Hebrew language. It means to be perfect or blameless, to be sound and complete with perfection. Now, how could God tell us, tell Abraham, and by virtue of that, tell us to walk blamelessly or perfectly? How could God say that to us? That's actually a good answer because he's God. What else could he say? I mean, he's God. What? Is God going to tell us, you know, allow a little bit of sin, get off course sometimes? He's God. He says, walk perfectly, walk blameless. And just because we cannot fully achieve that, and we certainly can't, okay, we fall upon the grace of God, and he makes that very clear too, that we're to fall upon the grace of God. You know, it's not of works, lest any man should boast. We're saved uh, by, we're saved through faith and by grace. It's not a works, lest anyone should boast. God makes that very clear. But we're to set our sights on perfection and blamelessness. Uh, the old saying that you've heard before, if you aim for the lamplight and you miss, you'll hit the pole. But if you aim for the pole and you miss, you'll hit the ditch. Yeah. Um, and we need to set our sights. I heard a just a, a great, I put it on my Facebook page. It was so good. If you got, if you're on Facebook and you got seven or eight minutes to go on there and listen to it, a, uh, somebody, a, a reporter was questioning uh, the governor, I think it is of Kentucky, Scott Belvin, I think is in Bevelin or something like that, about, you know, uh, gun control. I'm not saying his name right, but it's on my Facebook page. I just shared it tonight. And uh, they were, you know, the typical snarky reporter, you know, how can you, how can you not favor limiting all the guns when there is all this violence happening and stuff? And he went into, look, I'm summarizing this, but it's, the guns aren't the problem, it's our culture. I loved what he said. He said, when I was a kid, 
not only could you take guns to school, but we all had guns in our cars. And we, I mean, I remember my high school uh, senior picture. I just saw it not that long ago. Someone put it on Facebook, and one of the kids is holding a shotgun in a senior picture. You can't do that nowadays, right? You know, it's not guns to kill, it's the culture. And he went into, okay, how many, uh, how many video games do we have the kids playing that are not just violent, but you've got to go back and kill the people to get points? Okay, and how many babies have we aborted? Oh, they loved it when he, he said it a little more eloquently than that. But how many babies have we aborted? And how, many, uh, how much uh, euthanasia is happening in our country? Basically, he was saying, my appeal is not that it's the guns, because there have always been guns. And he said, actually... While there, there are more guns today than there were, there are more guns in existence, but if you look at the number of households that own guns, less households own guns than have owned guns ever in our history. Yeah. Though there, you know, the population's bigger and there are more guns, yes, but as far as households, there are less guns than we've ever had in America. Guns are not the problem. The problem is that we have this culture that doesn't value life. We don't value life anymore. And of course, you know, the reporter's snarky about it and stuff. But, but he says, you're out of your mind if you think that we can just take guns away and it's going to fix anything. You should just, if you got Facebook, listen. He does, says that much more eloquently than I do. Well, okay, I shared that story and then I got off course a little bit. Like that never happens, right? But... Uh, he was talking about, and he said, "He said, I know one of the first things you're going to say is, is you're going to say, look at that guy. He, he's got this problem, meaning himself. You know, he's got this problem. Or look at Trump. He's got this problem, and he's, he's got that problem. And he said, you know, I'm not willing to accept that excuse. We're supposed to be aiming for perfection. Just because we've all got flaws and problems doesn't give us the excuse not to aim for perfection. Now, he being a politician said it much more eloquently than I just said. But I thought, man, that kind of encapsulates the point here. What's God going to say? Go live in sin? Go mess up? Go. No, he's God, man. He's going to set the standard at perfection, at flawlessness. Are we going to attain that? Absolutely not. But we should be working towards it. And we just say, there but by the grace of God go I. I know that I'm not going to attain perfection. I get it that I have all kinds of sins and personality flaws and, you know, this and that and the other thing. I get it. And that's why I'm going to be the first one to say, I'm not saved by works. I'm saved by the grace of God. But I'm still going to strive for perfection. Exactly. Running the race, fighting the fight. But you see, we've developed this mindset in the culture that because we can't be perfect, just quit. And that is a problem. Yeah. And that is a mindset in this culture that people have adapted. We used to love it when people, you know, they humble themselves and say, well, you know, I'm not perfect. Well, of course, because we can identify with that. But we've taken that and we've made it because we're not perfect. We'll just do whatever we want. Just do whatever you want. You can't be perfect anyway. Well, if you aim for the, the, the ditch, I guarantee you're going to hit the ditch. Aim for the la lamplight, you might hit the post, but, you know, uh, you want to set your aims high. God's aim for Abraham was to walk in holiness. And here's the cool thing about holiness. While holiness, in a sense, we're never going to attain it, okay? Here's the great thing about God. I don't have to stay the same. The fact that I've been forgiven, also He gives me the grace that I can get better. Now that, in of itself, that does not save me, okay? I'm not saved because I'm a better person today than I was yesterday, because I'm only saved by the blood of Jesus. But because I'm saved, I can, I can become a, a, a better person. Does that make sense? I can make, I can make my goal to become, that's the walk of faith. That's why God told Abraham, walk before me. It's step by step. Aim for perfection. Be perfect before me. And just don't be proud, you know, because you're going to mess up. Admit it when you do. Admit it and quit it. But aim for perfection. Walk the walk of faith. Um, actually, I found the verse I was, said I didn't have. Here it is. Uh, 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 it's regarding Christ. I thought there was, it was about Abraham, but it's First Peter 2.21. It says, Christ also suffered for us, leaving us the example that we should walk according to his steps. Christ suffered for us, leaving us the example that we should walk according to his steps. Now, here's where uh, there are different schools 
of thought within Christianity. And some people are so into the example of Christ and the example of Abraham that they dismiss the conversion experience. It's very works-oriented. Like the Catholic Jesuits would be very much that way, very works-oriented. They're too far the other direction. But that's, by and large, not the problem we have in our culture today. Okay? The problem that we have in our culture today is mainly, hey, everybody's messed up, so let's just not even try. Let's just do whatever we want to do. We're not perfect anyway. But we have a, a pattern. We have an example. You know, why try to do this on your own when you don't have to? We can walk in the steps of Abraham. We can walk in the steps of Christ. It's an example. It's a pattern that we have to follow. Okay, he also says, I'll go ahead and just read a couple verses. Matthew 5.48, it's, he says, Therefore be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. I mean, what else is he going to say? Perfect. Now, some have pointed out, and I agree with this, that holiness is not just moral perfection, it's wholeness. And the word does mean wholeness, completeness, okay, soundness. And uh, Eastern cultures understand that a lot better because we're more pragmatist in the West generally, and in the East they're more holistic thinking, right? They understand, and that, that's coming here now a lot too, but they understand it's, it's mind, spirit, soul, body, right? Got to be healthy in all those areas. Well, holiness encapsulates all of that. It, holiness means wholeness or completeness. Uh, you know, that's uh, when people were healed many times in the New Testament, it says that they were made whole. They were made complete. And that's, again, that idea of holiness. So it's not just moral perfection, okay? But the point is that if we walk in the step, according to the steps of faith, if we follow the pattern that we've been given, we can get better, even though that in and of itself doesn't save us. Okay, and last verse, and then uh, we'll move on from this because I know you get it. But the last, the last uh, one being the, the Apostle Paul told us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. He does not say work for your salvation because if you can work for it for a hundred lifetimes and you're never going to attain it. You don't work for salvation, you work out salvation. When you work out a muscle, what happens? It gets stronger. I've never understood this mindset that people have that I'm going to get saved and then I'm going to keep the same struggles for the rest of my life. I don't want that. When I get saved, I want to be set free. It doesn't mean I don't sin, but I don't want to be in bondage to stuff, man. I want freedom. I want, I want the first fruits of heaven now. And we get that by working out our salvation. You work it out. You, you, you work it out. You know, you lift weights. You get stronger. The weights don't give you the muscle. Your mom and dad gave you the muscle. They don't give you the muscle, but you work them out and you grow stronger. Uh, uh, we're saved by the grace of God. God gave us our salvation, but it, it, we work it out. We grow stronger in our life, with, sometimes with some heavy lifting, right? Heavy lifting. We work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And the Word does say the Lord uh, will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. So if you feel like you got strong temptations in your life, you shouldn't take that as... I'm, a, I'm, I'm just too weak. You should take that as, wow, I've come a long ways. I could have never handled that before. I could have never handled that before. And now temptations, you know, we're not always talking just about the, the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh. There is any number of temptations in life, right? I mean, I think of, of uh, you know, the things that I don't even think about anymore that when I was younger, I couldn't have handled them at all. You know, you think about, uh, I mean, even just being, being in, in ministry. Actually, it was uh, Julius Caesar who said, experience is the best teacher. And uh, it was other, someone else that came along later and said, no, it's evaluated experience that is the best teacher. If you don't evaluate your experiences, you learn nothing. You keep repeating them, right? But uh, there's a sense, if you want to say it the way Julius Caesar said it, experience is the greatest teacher. We work out our faith with fear and trembling. We walk in the steps of faith. We aim for perfection. And we grow stronger and stronger as we do it. I do not have the same level of temptation in my life today as I had 10 years ago. And even if I fail, I'm going to get up a lot quicker today than I got up 10 years ago. Because that's what happens when you get stronger, right?
Amen. God wanted me on that for some reason, so I won't ask anyone to raise your hand and confess your sins, but you just take it to heart, okay? Because he, we, I did not intend to grind away at that. Okay, very quickly. Uh, the next, one of the next steps was humility. You see that Abraham fell on his face before God. You know, uh, we're sometimes just so humbled when, when God begins to bring the promise to pass, especially when it's something that you've waited for and then you finally see it coming to pass. Isn't that such a humbling experience? I mean, you just got to kind of sit there and take it in. I think, uh, you know, in, when we lived in North Dakota and a few times we went to the Badlands, if you've ever heard of the North Dakota Badlands, it really is a, a sight to see. Uh, but when you're driving in from the east driving west, you know, North Dakota's flat for as far as the eye can see, and you're driving, there's like a, a bump in the road, and you go up over this bump in the road, and all of a sudden it looks like you're on another planet. You break into the Badlands. And uh, if, if you should go look at them on the computer or look at pictures if you've never seen it. It looks like another planet. Teddy Rosenvelt loved the Badlands. That's where he would go do hunting expeditions and all that because uh, it's otherworldly. Uh, but you just kind of you break into and But what I'm saying is like you're driving in like on the interstate is the direction that we would usually come in. You're driving into the interstate. It all looks normal. And then you break over that crest. And it's almost like you just want to pull over and take it in for a minute because it's unbelievable. You, it, it's just literally unbelievable if you've never seen it to look back and see the, the plains of North Dakota as far as the eye you can see. And then you turn this way and it looks like you're on another planet with the, bat, with the Badlands, that it could just be such a vast, uh, vast difference. Well, Abraham, you know, is at this place of humility where he just has to take it in because he has believed God. It has been a fight. It has been a struggle. It has taken a lot longer than he expected it to take. But now he's on the cusp of the thing where God is saying, it's time. Your wife is going to have this child, not an Ishmael, an Isaac, the child of promise. And Abraham just has to humbly stand there and take it in for a minute. And I, I think we need some more moments of that in our lives when instead of just quickly moving on to the next thing, sometimes we just need to stop and quietly contemplate it because uh, God will always fulfill His Word, but usually there's a journey. There's seed, there's time, and there's harvest. And sometimes time can be very long, right? I think it must have been the same for Joshua and Caleb when they entered the land. I mean, they were right there. It was within grasp. And then because of something that wasn't even their fault, they had to wait another 40 years to go in. But when Caleb went in, he was ready, wasn't he? He was like, I'm taking that mountain, man. You're not putting me off any longer. It's time to take the mountain. Okay, so there's a sense of humility. Okay, I'm going to fast track a bunch of this. But geez, I didn't even get the circumcision yet. That's like one of the main things in the chapter. Okay, but uh, you, you get it. Okay, uh, God said circumcise basically everyone... That's part of your household, all the servants, everyone. It's, it's a, a sign of the covenant. It was an, but we know, because you've heard this enough that I know that you'll know this without me going to the Scriptures. Circumcision was always intended to be an outward sign of an inward commitment, wasn't it? Doesn't the Bible say that over and over? And a lot of people got off track. They thought, well, if I just get circumcised, hey, I'm one of God's people. I can do whatever I want. Well, that's as foolish as people today that say, if I just say a sinner's prayer, I can, I'm saved. I'm going to do anything I want. No, because your heart wasn't circumcised. Your heart wasn't circumcised. Now, if I had time, I would draw the parallels between baptism and circumcision because to a large degree, New Testament baptism is what Old Testament circumcision was. But again, I don't want to dismiss it, but I think you know many of these things. Uh, where I want to get to, though, is I want to get to the names. Uh, in this chapter, of course, the names changed. Abram, which meant honored father, God changed his name to Abraham, which meant father of the multitude. Isn't it cool how a slight little change can make a big difference? Okay, but now listen. <laughs> we don't talk about this much, but the name that I really love is, is Sarai, because look at this. Okay, um, most scholars believe that Sarai, Sarai, 
Her name meant strife, contention, and quarrelsome. So if we're going to go to the, the uh, meaning of the name, Sarai was a, a crotchety old woman, man. She was quarrelsome, grumpy, moody, strife. That's what Sarai means. Now this is where Abraham's interaction with his family changed because God said, hey, you're not going to call her Sarai anymore. You're going to call her Sarah. And what does Sarah mean? Does anyone remember? Princess. Princess. So <laughs> God said, hey, Abraham, honored father, you're going to be the father of the multitudes through Isaac. The time has finally come. But what you're going to do is you're going to quit calling your wife the grumpy old woman, and you're going to start calling her princess. <laughs> you're going to speak it over. <laughs> Why are all the women quiet and all the men <laughs> snickering and stuff? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. But <laughs> there's a good lesson in that, though. Isn't it, isn't it cool how a little, little change can make a big difference in your life, right? A little change in both of them made a big difference. It's great to be an honored father, but it's better to be the father of a multitude because then it's no longer theory. That means it's happening. It's coming to pass. I love a good theory, but I love it better where the rubber meets the road and where it is real and it is happening. Uh, it's not theory when it's happening, and now it's time for it to actually happen. And Sarah... Uh, you know, like I spent time teaching last week, we need to cut her some slack. The road was long, right? The road had to be long to be Abram's wife. Uh, but God changed her from being contentious, strife-filled, and quarrelsome. And I don't know how much of that she really was. I'm just embellishing a little. But remember, she did last chapter blame Abraham after she said, go in to the maidservant, and he did it. And what happened after... Uh, what happened after uh, that all happened? She said, my sin be upon your head. <laughs> you did it. it your <laughs> well, God, God changed her from a quarrelsome old woman to a princess, and he appointed her to bear the promised seed. God kept his covenant to Sarah. You know, uh, uh, Abraham, I, I get the, the, the paternal you know, especially in ancient cultures, it was the paternal, and, you know, Christ and God is in the masculine, like it or not, that's the way that it is. And so I understand that. But God really uh, did a lot in Sarah that we overlook. He really did. I'm not sure on this, but isn't it that the Jewish, uh, gene, the Jewish lineage is passed through the mother, isn't it? Isn't it through the mother? I think I had heard that before. Don't quote me on that. I'd have to look it up. But I think you're a Jew because your mother was a Jew, not because your father was a Jew. But I'll have to double check that. So don't look it up. That's just something coming to mind. But, you know, Sarah, God made her a princess, and, and kings and nations really did come out of her. Uh, and uh, God honored her along with Abraham. So that's, that's good. Okay, well, it's getting late, so I know we need to uh, wrap it up. But as I started, the last thing we see here is that Abraham obeyed God. Abraham believed God. And, of course, uh, Isaac's name there was laughter. We'll next week or the week after look at uh, Isaac's name a little bit more because Abraham laughed, and then Sarah laughed later, and God got after Sarah. What's the difference? We'll talk about that later because I know it's time to go. Okay? I'll make you chew on that one for a couple weeks. Why did God tell Abraham when he laughed, you'll name him Isaac, which means laughter. But when Sarah laughed, he said, you laughed. And she said, I didn't laugh. And he said, yes, you did. You laughed. <laughs> hey, Sarah, arguing with God. There she goes again, right? But, but God kept reminding her of her name, Sarah. Princess. All right. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word and for all that it teaches us now. And uh, we receive it, and we ask that you would help us walk in the steps.